Okay, good evening. It is uh, Tuesday, May 14th at 7 o'clock, and I will call the meeting of the Common Council of the City of Platteville to order. We're in the City Hall. We'll start with uh, roll call. Robin Klein? Here. Isaac Shanley? Here. Eileen Nichols? Here. Barbara Stockhausen? Here. Sina Sharp? Here. Barbara Doss? Here. Ken Killian? Here. Okay, the first item on our agenda is a special presentation about Creative Economy Week. And uh, I'll ask Catherine to come forward and we have a proclamation that uh, I'll uh, read through. So Creative Economy Week is May 11th to the 18th of 2019. Whereas the city of Platteville recognizes that investment in creative economic economy development, creative placemaking, and civic engagement through the arts and creativity are important to the health and vibrancy of the community and its future. And whereas the city of Platteville appreciates that creative economy development and community cultural engagement are directly related to economic vitality, education for the 21st century, engaged residents, and a community's vibrancy and success, According to Dun and Bradstreet, there are nearly 10,000 businesses in Wisconsin involved in the creation or distribution of the arts, ranging from nonprofit museums, symphonies, and theaters to for profit film, architecture, and design companies. The U.S. Bureau of Economic Analysis and the National Endowment for the Arts report that nationally the arts and culture sec cultural sector contributed $804.2 billion or 4.3% to the nation's gross, gross domestic product in 2016. For Wisconsin, the arts and cultural sector impact is currently 9,749,065,000 and 3.1% of the Wisconsin economy, contributing 94,167 jobs. That compares to 31,000 jobs in Wisconsin's papermaking sector and 35,000 in the state's biotech industry. The total economic contribution of museums in 2016 amounted to more than 50 billion in gross domestic product, 726,200 jobs and 12 billion in taxes to local, state and federal governments. And whereas the city of Platteville acknowledges that the arts spark creativity and innovation, the conference board reports that creativity is among the top five applied skills sought by business leaders, with 72% saying creativity is of high importance when hiring. Their Ready to Innovate report concludes, the arts, music, creative writing, drawing, and dance provide skills sought by employers of the, of the 21st century. Nobel laureates in the sciences are 17 times more likely to be actively engaged in the arts than other scientists. Whereas the city of Platteville celebrates impressive creative econo economy activities, projects and initiatives such as education and engagement programs at museums, revitalization initiatives, and civic engagement projects happening in communities across Wisconsin during Creative Economy Week. Now therefore, I, Barb Dawes, Common Council President of the city of Platteville, do hereby, hereby declare the week of May 11th to 18th, 2019 as Creative Economy Week to celebrate and promote the arts, creativity, and vitality in and for our community. There you go, Catherine. Well, thank you so much. And as part of Creative Economy uh, Economic Week, just want to highlight our Chalk and Cheese Fest. Um, I'm just one of many members of the PATH Committee, which is the Platteville Arts Transit or Trail, sorry, um, History Committee. So our Chalk and Cheese Fest will be a one-day outdoor art food and musical f uh, festival on Saturday, June 22nd. It will be in City Park. And right now we have a call out <coughs> for artists with a registration deadline uh, approaching soon. So this event celebrates the completion of the PATH plan. And you can go to platteville.org forward slash PATH for more information. And I'm sure you'll see plenty of these around town. <coughs> Thank you. And the date is again June 22nd. Second. Saturday, June so 22nd. Okay. Well, thank you. All right, we'll move on to consideration of the consent calendar. The following items may be approved on a single motion or vote due to their routine nature or previous discussion. Please indicate to the council president if you would prefer separate discussion and action. And uh, we have the council minutes from 4-16-19 uh, special meeting and the 4-23-19 regular meeting. 
payment of bills, financial reports for April, appointment, appointments to boards and commissions. And tonight I have two appointments to the plan commission. Uh, they are Mark Myers, uh, he's a new member, and Ellen Stelflug, who completed a uh, partial term and is now being appointed to a three-year term. Licenses, one and two, one-year and two-year operator licenses to sell and serve alcohol. So, do I hear a motion on the consent calendar? I move to approve all items listed on our consent calendar. Second. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the consent calendar as printed. We'll vote. Fine. Yes. Shanley? Yes. Nichols? Yes. Stockhausen? Yes. Sharp? Yes. Dawes? Yes. Killian? Yes. Motion approved. Okay, we're in the section of the agenda called Citizens' Comments, Observations, and Petitions, if any. And I know that somebody asked me if they could speak in this section tonight, but I don't think they filled out a green sheet. So quickly run, get a green sheet, and then uh, we have the new student body president from the University of Wisconsin Platteville uh, recently elected, and he wanted to introduce himself. And so uh, we thought we would provide this opportunity during this little section. So. Then you can just hand it to me as you go by. And then you go to the microphone. So yeah, as uh, Barb said, I'm the new student body president at Platteville. Um, so I just want to kind of introduce <laughs> myself. Um, my majors are sustainable renewable energy systems, which is like a branch off of electrical engineering and political science. Um, so dual majoring in, in that asset. Um, I'm a little late tonight because I just had a final. So it's finals week. So end of the academic term is um, this Friday for anybody who's wondering. Um, and kind of a few things that I'm working on is a better campus community relations, which I've kind of been in contact with a couple city, city members as well, um, kind of working on that as aspect of it, as well as I live in Galena, so like 30 minutes away from here, so I plan on coming to a couple more of these um, throughout the summer as well, and also meeting up for a couple meetings. Um, and I guess I'm a freshman on, I'm a freshman on campus, um, so I'll be a sophomore starting next academic year, and um, if your any. name? Ben. But your whole name for the council. Ben Belke is my full name. Yes. Okay. And if people wanted to contact you, how would they do it? Um, you can contact me uh, by either email at belkebe at uwplat.edu or That's good. All or right. text. And we can, we can send that. So if anybody has questions or anything... Uh, that's where Ben can be reached. I yep. didn't know if you had a student body president at some address or not, but not. Mm -mm. Okay. Not really. All right. Well, congratulations right. Yeah. on your election and Thank you. and on completing your finals. Yes. Successfully. Hopefully. <laughs> All right. We'll move on to reports. Uh, reports in your packet. Uh, plan commission. Robin, anything? No, I think nothing to add. All right. Water and sewer. Nichols, Killian, or Shanley? No okay. addition on my part. Okay, community safe routes? Nothing to add. Zena? Nothing. Museum board? Nothing to add. A housing authority <coughs> board? No addition. And historic preservation commission? No addition. Okay, the other reports in your packet were water and sewer financial report, the airport financial report, and department progress reports. Anybody with any questions? Okay, then we'll move along to our first action item, which is Resolution 1906, awarding the sale of $1.15 $1 million in GO Corporate Purpose Bond Series 2019A. Nicola. Thank you. So the City of Platteville in its 2019 CIP budget included $1,095,000 for street reconstruction 
which was to be funded uh, through the, issu the issuance of general <coughs> obligation bonds. Um, the, uh, the Common Council did approve uh, the, uh, the initial resolution authorizing the issuance of those bonds, and uh, today was the uh, sale of those bonds, and Dawn gunderson Shield uh, from Ellis, which is our municipal advisors, is here uh, to walk us through the results of that sale. Thank you, Dawn. Good evening. Uh, when I was here at your meeting a month ago or so, we, you adopted a resolution for us to proceed with the competitive bond process for the issuance of these bonds. And since that time, there was a preparation of an uh, official statement, a prospectus for the uh, investment community. We held a rating call with staff and Standard & Poor's uh, rating agency. And this morning, we took competitive bids on that sale. So you've been provided with two documents this evening. One was a, an updated resolution that was prepared this afternoon by your bond attorney, Quarles and Brady. And that resolution is similar to what was in your packet, but was updated with the results of the sale. And I also uh, laid on your table this evening a sale day report. And I'll first of all note that the dollar amount that you'll be considering in your resolution is lower than what was on your agenda. Uh, that amount is $1,125,000. The agenda has $1,150,000. And I'll explain why the reduction took place. On page two of that report, uh, we have a table that kind of summarizes the, the uh, results of the sale. We went, as I said, to a competitive basis um, with seven bids. With that rating discussion, S&P Global Securities affirmed your AA minus, and that certainly um, holds true in, in the interest rates that we received on the issue and the number of bidders. So our low bid was Bernardi Securities out of Chicago, and there's a comparison of the low to the high bid, what we call is the TIC, or the true interest cost. That's the determination of the low bid. Um, it's the average cost of the issue, and, as well as the underwriter discount, which is a bid item in the process as well. To the high bid, the difference about $15,000 in overall cost. Uh, so, you know, the reason we uh, go through this process is to try to look for the most economic financing um, available in the market. So we feel that the competitive process provides that. Um, there were no term bonds in the issue, so the city treasurer will serve as the paying agent. Uh, we do have a call provision, so um, any time after 2028, these bonds will be callable. Uh, because of the way the bids came in, we, we had, did have a premium bid, which we were allowed to downsize your issue by 25000 So that's why the principal amount is lower than was initially out into the market. Uh, there was a premium bid, bid on the issue, meaning the uh, in exchange for the couponing, they they give you money in advance. So that premium allowed us to downsize. We also have excess premium, which will go into your debt service fund to pay for interest. And you can, we'll show you how the impact of that is. It really kind of negates any uh, levy impact in 2020 because of this, because it'll offset that um, um, interest expense that year. So the consideration will be the resolution that was adopted or provided for you this evening. On page three, we've got a tabulation of all the bids we received listing the low bid first, which is Bernardi Securities. And if you go to the far right, that true interest rate, that's the comparison that we provide when we get the, all the bids in place. Uh, we had a bid from Baird out of Milwaukee, the Baker Group out of Oklahoma City, uh, Bankers Bank out of Madison, Can uh, UMB Bank out of Kansas City, Northland Securities out of Minneapolis, and BOK Financial out of Milwaukee. So a lot of regional um, interest. I, I say this is, is good. I was at a sale yesterday where we had four bids, so seven is, is real good, so a lot of demand um, for paper today in the market. On page five is kind of a side-by-side -side comparison. When, we were, when you authorized the preliminary sizing, that would have been on the right, our final sizing with a reduction in size. Uh, we've noted that there was a few issuance expenses that came in lower than our planning. We have um, this reoffering premium that's kind of bracketed in the middle uh, that we received, and it, the excess is then deposited in the debt service fund, hence allowing us to downsize that issue as well. 
And ultimately, then, if you look on the larger pullout page, six, uh, here's the actual structure. We reduce some of the later maturities, helping to reduce the overall cost of financing. The kind of focusing to the bottom of the page, you'll see our principal reduced by 25,000. Interest is a little higher because of the couponing from the premium, but that is more than offset by the uh, um, amount that's into debt service. So the overall cost to finance these projects this, um, with this issue was about 47,000 less than our estimates at the time of planning. I also wanna note then um, on the area with a debt service, column that says deposit and debt service fund bracketed. It offsets the interest expense that was expected to take place in 2020. So the, um, on the far right, you'll say that the, our tax rate projections for levy for debt would, would remain the same as they were in, um, in, in 19 as a result of that. The last few schedules that are attached, we have provided you with a copy of that rating report from Standard & Poor's. So please, if you have not had the opportunity, take the time to review that. Uh, it, it certainly highlights the, um, uh, your, your management, your, your um, strong management, strong budgetary performance. It's a couple, somewhat blank page. Uh, you have a little bit of high debt profile, but uh, it's manageable, and um, they do address some of the um, weaker things within your com community, but or demographics <coughs> and your um, economics. But they recognize the uh, economic development that's taken place. But strong management, strong budgetary performance, strong budgetary flexibility, very strong liquidity. So those are some very key points that keep your rating high. Um, any increases in your economic indicators would help you go up higher or uh, any strength in the, um, uh, you know, your liquidity would certainly help, but the, the pressures that would put downward pressure would be um, um, if you were to start operating on an unbalanced basis, using up your fund balance for operations or um, in decreasing your budgetary flexibility. So you guys should applaud yourself for the efforts that you've made to keep that rating high. And the very last page, just to give you an idea where interest rates have been over the last six or the last 12 months, um, this timed out pretty well in the course of the last 12 months for, for debt. You can see, um, and this is a 20 year indices, which is a maturity on a 20 year issue, but the trend line would be the same. Um, you can see if you look to the, that May 19th date on the far right, we're basically at the lowest point in the last 12 months for uh, the market in terms of interest rates. So that certainly um, is a positive in terms of the timing of issuance of this debt. So I'm happy to answer any questions any of you may have either on the uh, Salter report or the resolution. Questions that anyone has of Dawn? Don, I have to say thank you for helping us, uh, not only with this, but with our long-range financial plan. I think that uh, the work we've done over the past three or four years have led to these kind of good things. Yeah. So. Well, they certainly do acknowledge that you do long-term planning, not only your capital, but also your operations. So that's, that's a very good thing, and you should be applauded for that. All right. Ask a question. Go ahead. <laughs> Um, well, thank you for all the work to put this together, and yay for catching it at the lowest point. Um, uh, not to go to a negative, but a question, just for clarification. Certainly. So our, um, as far as our rating, so the comment on a weak economy, um, can you help us understand what we could do to improve that situation? Yeah, so I, I, I think that the words are a little bit harsh when they use weak. I, I think that that's just their terminology that they kind of fall into brackets. Um, you know, part of the influence that happens here in your community is, is because of the, the student population you have, it draws your income levels down, it draws your, um, um, you have somewhat the market value in the housing stock. So those are some of the things that I think they look at when they compare you with the national level. I mean, when they rate you, it's not just your community, but they look at your the state, the regional, the national level. So on a national basis, your statistics are a little bit low. Um, you know, efforts towards economic development that certainly spur 
new job base and new employment base. And those things are certainly things that you may have a little bit control over. And I think you've done a good job of, of some initi initiatives to make that happen. But those are the types of things that would drive that economic number up. Other questions? I would just add, I think that as a rural community, we swim a little bit upstream with respect to how bond raters uh, measure, measure that. I would, unless anybody else has anything else, I would move to approve resolution 1906, awarding the sale of 1125000 actually, um, of general obligation corporate purpose bond series 2019A as presented. Second. Uh, we have a motion and a second to approve resolution 1906. Uh, we'll vote. The second. I'm sorry. Robin. Okay. Klein? Yes. Shanley? Yes. Nichols? Yes. Stockhausen? Yes. Sharp? Yes. Doss? Yes. Killian? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Dawn. <laughs> Then, and now we'll move on to resolution 1907, establishing agency fares for the taxi. All right, yeah. so yeah. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and read this. Currently, human service agencies, uh, specifically managed care organizations, such as Inclusa Iris and Logistic Care, provide prepaid punch cards to their clients for transportation. The punch cards are purchased from a designated state funding source and through the punch card system, the HSA pays $2.75 for a one-way taxi ride, the same cost that any adult rider pays for a one-way ride. Agency fares are collected directly from the HSA for which the service is to be delivered, not the individual passenger. <coughs> so for a one-way ride, the general public pays $2.75 for an adult rider, $2.50 for the elderly, disabled, or for children, this low cost for a one-way ride is available through federal funding, which covers 40% of expenses for rural transit systems each year. Um, the true cost of a one-way taxi ride is usually in the five to nine dollar range. So an agency fare does not change the amount the general public pays, and establishing an agency fare allows this transit system to recoup the full expense of providing rides to HSA clients ensuring that uh, such rides do not reduce state and federal aids designated for providing transit to the public at large. Running Inc., the taxi operator, operates in 18 communities, and Platteville is the only community not charging an agency fare. The Transportation Committee made a motion to approve the resolution to institute an agency fare of $6 per one-way ride uh, set to begin June 1st, 2019. Questions of Catherine on agency fares. <coughs> Establishing agency fares. Were there questions about the change? How was this company going to handle the change for the people who use those taxis on a regular basis? So running, e uh, this discussion actually began back in February, and they knew we were going to move forward with this. And that's why they, um, I've been keeping them up to date that this is happening. They're notifying the companies, and that's why we've set it to June 1st. And the clients, or the riders? It been doesn't informed? impact the riders. It's the HSA handles all of it for them, oh. so it won't impact the riders. So they get a punch card, and, right. and they don't know if the punch card costs $2 or $12 or right. $22. Correct. And, okay. Other questions? Do I hear any motions? I move to resolution 1907, establishing a $6 agency fare, which will begin on June 1, 2019. Second to the motion. Okay, we have a motion by Eileen, a second by Ken, to adopt resolution 1907, establishing agency fares for the taxi. We'll vote. Klein? Yes. Chanley? Yes. Nichols? Yes. Stockhausen? Yes. Sharp? Yes. Doss? Yes. Killian? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, we'll move on to the next uh, item on the agenda, which is establishing a standard parcel fare. This also deals with the taxi. Yes. 
So currently the city's taxi has two parcel charges uh, for prescription pickup for $10 and a wheelchair return at $3.50. Um, the taxi has an agreement with Walgreens to pick up prescriptions <coughs> from Walgreens for patients without the patient need to be in the taxi. That's the prescription charge. And then there's also a wheelchair charge for when a wheelchair must be returned to the original destination. The wheelchair charge is not an additional charge when a rider has a wheelchair, just for clarification. Um, to assist with accounting, uh, staff recommends having a st standard $10 parcel charge for both. And the Transportation Committee uh, discussed this and made a motion to approve the standard $10 parcel charge. Okay, questions? Questions? Do move to approve a standard $10 parcel charge. Second. So we have a motion by Ken and a second by Robin to approve the standard $10 parcel charge for the taxi, for the wheelchair and for prescription pickup, wheelchair return and prescription pickup. We'll vote. Klein? Yes. Shanley? Yes. Nichols? Yes. Stockhausen? Yes. Sharp? Yes. Doss? Yes. Killian? Yes. Motion carries. Okay, the next item on our agenda <coughs> is a conditional use permit for 1425 East Business Highway 151. This was uh, tabled in September of 2018. Joe, would you like to walk us through uh, the process here that we're gonna? Sure, um, just for, well, since it was back in September when this was dealt with, just for a uh, little backup um, history. U-Haul uh, has purchased that property. It was the former Kmart property. Um, I'm sure people have noticed they are using the, the property now. They rent trucks, trailers, sell moving equipment, uh, install hitches currently at that site, which is permitted uh, under the B3 zoning. Uh, the other thing they'd like to do with that site is use it for uh, store, self storage warehouse use so people can rent the space to store their, their own personal items on that property. Um, that part of the use requires a conditional use permit under the B3 zoning. So they applied for that uh, back in September um, for that part of the request. Uh, at that time, the council tabled the request. Um, so there's been no action on it since then. Um, the staff has continued to have conversations with U-Haul on the use of this uh, property. And they have tweaked their submittal a little bit and they are asking for uh, the item to be reconsidered. So since it was tabled last time, we're suggesting that, um, and it's, since it's been such a long time since it's been discussed, we're suggesting the action tonight, if everybody's in agreement, would be to take it off the table. But if you may have noticed, uh, there will be no actual vote on the conditional use permit itself. So the only action will be to take it off the table. We've got it on for the information discussion this evening. Um, the actual action would be at the 28th, uh, May 28th meeting. So that would give us time to provide notice to the adjoining property owners and do a notice in the paper. So if people are interested in um, this issue, they have an opportunity to come and speak or at least to listen. So that is what we are recommending as far as the process. Okay, so the action is to mo remove it from the table. Right. That allows us to discuss it during information and discussion later in the meeting. But the, the actual vote won't be till Until, next yeah, meeting. so it's information and discussion this time and action at a future meeting. Correct. Okay. We'll make a motion to remove this item from the table to allow action at the May 28th meeting. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to remove this item from the table. Uh, the cup permit for 1425 East Business Highway 151 will vote. Klein? Yes. Shanley? Yes. Nichols? Yes. Stockhausen? Yes. Sharp? Yes. Doss? Yes. Killian? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. Well, that's the end of our action items for tonight. So now we'll move on to information and discussion. The first information and discussion item is resolution, a resolution pe petitioning the Secretary of Transportation for airport improvement aid. And uh, so I'll uh, just like to introduce this. Um, back in January of 2017, the council passed resolution 17-02, 
which um, was the Platteville Municipal Airport six-year project plan. Um, since then, there has been some work done, and there are new uh, projects coming down the pike. There are uh, some adjustments to that plan, and so in order to qualify for aid, um, the council needs to consider uh, a second resolution. And uh, Bill Kloster, who is chairman of the Airport Commission, is here to explain that. Thank you, Bill. Bill Colster, 975 Highbury Circle, and I'm here uh, representing the Airport Commission and the airport. Uh, first of all, I'd like to talk about the, the, uh, the program that we're asking you to petition, and that's the Airport Improvement Program, which allows eligible airports to compete for aid to make specific improvements. Over the past 10 years, the Platteville Municipal Airport has used the Airport Improvement Program to complete projects totally more than $5 million. The program requires that the owner of the airport contribute 5% of the cost, while the remaining 95 is covered by the state and federal aid. So for every 90, we paid $5 for every $100 of aid we get back. It's a great way to get federal dollars back into the community. The funding comes from the Aviation Trust Fund, which derives its money from aviation-related fees and taxes and does not impact other DOT projects. So this money comes from every time you take a flight on an aircraft, a commercial aircraft, part of your ticket price is a fee, an airport fee. The airline that flies that aircraft pays taxes on the fuel that it burns, and that money goes into the Airport Trust Fund which helps fund these different types of projects. Um, the state also has a program for some projects that are not eligible under the Federal Aviation Improvement Program that are eligible for state funding with a 50 to 20% local match. Part of this process requires the governing body and the owner, in this case the Common Council and City, to petition the Secretary of the Department of Transportation for projects that it may undertake in the future under the AIP. This petition needs to be updated to add some additional items like snow removal and grass cutting equipment and reconstruction and rehab of our taxiways. The airport is beginning the process to develop a new master plan and this plan will dictate the projects we will be able to <coughs> undertake. There are a lot of projects listed because the master plan will dictate a course of action that could take us in one of two directions. So this request covers both directions. There is no requirement to undertake all the projects that are listed in the petition. Last night at the meeting of the airport uh, commission, a public information meeting was held on this topic and the commission also passed a resolution and our six year plan seeking this petition. A copy of the resolution and a copy of the six year plan have been provided to you. I also wanna point out that this topic was uh, brought before the Planning Commission, and the Planning Commission voted in favor of moving forward with the petition. At this time, I'd like to entertain any questions that you might have. Okay, we, um, we have a resolution in our packet, 19-XX, and do you have that at all? Yes, I do. I don't have it. What, I've seen what, it. What it's, I'm wondering about is um, the last big paragraph of this uh, uh, petition. And so I'm looking for clarification. It says, we're the, the city of Platteville is the sponsor, okay? Uh, it says that the proportionate cost of the airport development project described above, which are to be paid by the sponsor to the secretary of the Wisconsin Department of Transportation, uh, to be held in trust for the purpose of the project. Any unneeded and unspent balance after the project is completed is to be returned to the sponsor by the secretary. Then the next uh, part says the sponsor will make available any additional monies that may be found necessary upon request of the secretary comma, to complete the project as described above. So could you explain that? In other words, is the secretary, could they be asking the city for additional funds? Well, it's, it's possible, but this goes through a very onerous state building pro, uh, process. 
And so uh, the way the process works, and we just went through one of these airport improvement pro projects here this past summer to redo one of our runways or resurface it rather and resurface our, our uh, ramp and everything. And that project went through a bidding process. It goes through an estimate by the Bureau of Aeronautics before it goes into the bidding process. They know roughly what the project should cost and they make sure before we start going down this, pro this route on these projects that there will be enough money in the project to cover it. In fact, uh, this last project, uh, we, we saved over, I think, $170,000 that was uh, allotted to the project by the, the federal government in the AIP program. So that, that money's still sitting out there in a pot. And if you look at our six-year plan, you can see that we have money from that project and other projects that are still in our account that the Bureau will be able to apply towards some of the things we're asking for for this year, such as uh, the, de the development of a master plan and also the purchase of snow removal equipment for the airport. But to answer your question, if this went all awry, if the engineers weren't doing their job, if the commission's not doing their job of oversight, uh, and this project went way over budget, then this allows that the city could be held responsible for, for paying that. It's the commission's job and the jobs of the engineers that we hire to not let that happen. My question basically was the possibility in the future of what might happen as far as responsibility of the city. Thank you. It, it can, but yeah. it's hopefully highly unlikely. So maybe you've said this twice even already tonight, but I didn't hear it as explicitly as I heard at the plan commission. The 5% obligation of the cities, you have funds in the airport commission account that you we, plan to use? We today? have been working with the airport commission with the, the operational account of the airport. We have been making those fund payments, those local matches. I can't guarantee that in the future, if, if we go into the project, if the map, we have to go through the master planning process. If we go through that process, if, it, if that master plan determines that the airport is eligible for a runway extension, and that is a significant ex extension, 5,000 uh, out to 5,000 feet, so it could be either 1,000 feet for one, one, run, one runway or about 1,500 feet for the other. Uh, with all the associated costs on that, we could get up into a, a high, higher number that we may have to come to the city and ask for assistance in funding that. The thing is, those projects don't go funding without the city's approval uh, to, to do it. So it's not gonna be something that the airport commission is gonna come in and say, hey, we started this project, we need money. We'll come and say, in order to complete this project, we'll need additional money from the city and It'll be up to the city at that time to determine what they want to do. What they want to do. And oh, by the way, you just had the briefing about how you can increase your bonds, bond rating, making improvements to the airport, give us a better airport to attract more business is one of the ways to do that. Other questions of uh, Bill? I noticed in your minutes of the commission that you discuss de-icing Considerably, but you're not going to do any program for that. That is correct. Okay. Uh, that's something that an airport our size normally does not do. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, then we'll move this uh, to action for at the next meeting. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Nicola. The next item for discussion is uh, the uh, conditional use permit for 1425 East Business Highway 151 U-Haul that's now off the table and can be discussed. Right. So as I mentioned before, we, we don't have to approve the, the rental of the trucks and that part of it. It's just the, the warehousing self-storage use on the property that um, requires the approval. So they're basically proposing, uh, I guess, the self-storage in three different formats or three different locations on this property. Uh, primarily, that will take place inside the existing building. 
Um, I did some very rough calculations uh, of, of the building uh, area. Uh, the building right now is approximately 102,000 square feet. Um, of that area, I'm guessing they're calculating about 20,000 square feet of that would be, uh, it's, it's kind of the white area on the plan, um, is the area that's for the sales of the uh, moving equipment, the installation of the hitches, the office space, and kind of some mis miscellaneous uh, circulation space, mm -hmm. mechanical space at the back of the building. Um, the about 54,000 square feet, give or take, would be used for the self-storage warehouses. So basically inside the building, they're going to build these little pods or uh, containers of different sizes that people can rent space within that. And then about 28,000 would be designated as a future development phase. So that mm -hmm. is, at this point, is not earmarked for any specific use. Then they also would like to construct two uh, additional storage warehouse buildings in the area of the parking lot now, kind of on the east side, uh, be just south of the Taco John's property. Um, and those buildings would each be 25 feet by 110 feet. There's a, a little bit different than what I identified in my staff report. But those would be uh, metal buildings typical of most of the self-storage buildings that we have elsewhere in the community. And again, those are um, of different sizes. Then on the kind of the southeast uh, portion of the, the property there, uh, what they're calling the van bodies that they would locate, basically the, the backs of the larger moving trucks. I assume when the trucks have mechanical issues, the engine transmission fails or something of that nature, they pick, take the back of the truck off, the, the body itself where you store your materials when moving it, place it on the site, and they take a bunch of those and put them next to each other. Uh, I think they actually attach them together, uh, cover it in metal so it basically looks like a storage building, and then they would lease out those uh, to individuals as well. So that would be the self-storage uh, warehousing use on the property would be in, in those uh, three areas. Um, so if, if you recall the last time this... Um, item came up and I think the, the kind of the reason it was tabled was there was some concern mentioned um, by some of the business owners property owners in that vicinity uh, basically about the the change of the property from retail to self-storage warehousing there was com some concern that that change in use is going to result in a, a, a drop in the amount of uh, activity uh, tra uh, traffic to that general vicinity. So from a business standpoint, less people coming to that area means potentially less customers. So that was a concern that they they had expressed um, back in September. And then there were some kind of some minor issues about the uh, appearance and so forth. Um, so it resulted in, in the tabling item. So as I mentioned earlier, staff has been working with uh, the U-Haul representatives to you know, try to figure out the best way to move this issue forward for consideration. So we do, I guess, have what we would consider a compromise uh, uh, solution. So basically we'd recommend approval of the storage warehouse use of this property with some conditions. Um, first one regarding the, the van bodies. Um, I had some initial concerns about uh, the appearance of that because I, I just visually thought a bunch of truck pieces sitting there. But they have indicated and showed some photos where they, as I mentioned, they do place them next to each other, they wrap them, and it does basically look the same as a storage building. So I think that is an improvement. But we did uh, recommend that they provide some additional plantings. Um, in that vicinity to screen that. Um, so they have included a landscape plan where they've identified um, some additional plantings to help provide some screening uh, to improve the appearance. Um, this was an item that went back to the, the plan commission meeting uh, back in September. They, they are not proposing it at this time, but just in case so it's covered that if there's ever a desire to store boats or RVs or campers or any other uh, equipment like that, outside of the building that that would not be part of this approval they would have to come back at a future date if they would like to do something like that so again so we could address screening and the visual impact of that so that is not a current request but in case that did come up we would like to make sure that's uh, identified in the future and then the other thing we're recommending is the 
the, identi the portion of the building that's identified as future development phase. And again, that's approximately 28,000 square feet by my calculations. Um, we're basically saying that that should be used for retail or other specified use in the B3 district. So basically what we're saying is they can go ahead with the, the storage of the, the other part of the building. They take this remaining part and for a minimum of two years, they uh, uh, lease it or make an attempt to lease it. They market it for use to other businesses for retail purposes. If after that minimum two year period, they are unsuccessful uh, in doing so, then they could come back in at that point and then request re basically reconsideration from the council to use that portion for uh, self storage use as well. So they're basically taking part of that building and keeping it for the time being as a, a potential retail space. So we're viewing that as a kind of a, as I mentioned, a compromise uh, situation to uh, try to address some of the concerns that were raised last time. So as I mentioned, this is uh, just on for information discussion at this point and uh, any action would be at the, the next meeting. Any questions? Yes, I have a couple of questions. Uh, this little picture what is that showing? So that would be one of the additional uh, storage buildings that they would like to construct, the 25 by 110. Okay. On the on the property, and I tried blowing that up and it just got blurry. So that's and then I stayed small. Was going to ask about the old van bodies, and tonight I found them. Uh, they're in, they're upside down here in our booklet, um, so. Supposedly there's going to be some trim around. Will these doors be no different? They're all red. They'll be changed. Um, actually, I'll let the applicant uh, answer that question. So we do have a U-Haul representative here. And introduce your uh, state your name and. <clears throat> well, my name is Adam Sunlightner, and we talked in the past. Um, yes. Yeah, so what we would do with those, they would stay orange. We reuse the whole back of the current trucks we have. So the orange doors is just one of our business colors. And then we'll reside the whole things with metal tin and make it look like one structure. So uh, I have a question. Do you mm -hmm. have any of these installed anywhere? Um, no, or is this... not that I do not in my area. Those pictures are from uh, Oregon. The state of Oregon. Yeah. So there is, there is no installation like this anywhere in Wisconsin at Not this yet. point? No. Yeah. And the roof is the roof of the old van body? Correct, yep. Okay. Up to 39, I didn't come to the Planning Commission. What's the significance of 39? We did, this did not come on the, this was not on the plan. Commission. That, that's, that's the number that is identified on the site plan that they submitted. 39 van bodies? Correct. So I have a question about the landscaping. Sure. Um, I'm assuming I'm going to start out by the, for lack of a better word, I'm going to start on the north, I guess that would be the northwest corner where mm -hmm. the pond is. So that green space exists as it is right now. Yes. And so there would be no change there. Correct. And then uh, I see display parking. There isn't that display parking is not there now. Is that correct? Up by the road? No, or, it uh, says just to the right. Yeah, by the, it says it, display parking. It's not striped on the parking lot. But okay. And then you, uh, how much of the green space exists on the uh, west side of the property? Is that additional green space, or does that already exist? So all the all the little circles, I guess the starburst-looking ones, are the current trees there. Okay. And then all the little tiny circles, I believe there's. I have it here. They're adding. We're adding six more trees there. Okay. Along the whole west edge. To yes. Clear to the south. Yep. Okay. And then as well as some planters and screening <coughs> where the parcel B is, I believe it is to kind of screen some of those orange doors as well. And then uh, at the corner of the building in the back, the southwest corner, is that green space? 
Yeah, everything everything shown on that landscaping plan is current minus the six trees and some. Okay, so that's current. I know that this big hillside here on the south side is current. Yep. Now, how about the space right next to the building on the east side? That's green. Is that green space now? <coughs> Correct. There's, there. Yep. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, and that's where we propose on adding some of the bushes there to. And then is the green space that is on the very east edge of the property, is that there now too? Correct. And that's where you're saying, Joe, additional trees are screening. Correct. My questions about that. Anybody with any additional questions? At this time, none of the people who are adjacent property owners have been advised of this new plan. Is that correct, Joe? Correct. But so I, I have the mailing list ready to go. I'll send it out tomorrow. If based, I was waiting to see what the action was this evening. Well, there is no action. To bring it as far the as the table item. Other questions? You had originally mentioned possibly selling an outlot at the front. Is that right? Up yeah. The pond? Is that so, still an option? Well, we took, I guess we, we sat down, we talked about it. We've been working with Joe and Karen. And if we're going to actively try to lease it, so that is 28,000 square feet, we're on board 100% on leasing that to any. I know that last, last time there was some discussion that maybe the city of Platteville could bring somebody in. Otherwise, we will lease it with a national company two years. And then after two years, we'll come back to you because the conditional use permit would not apply for that section. So after two years, if we get no work and I have, I can be like, look, we had, nobody came to us, then we can sit down and talk again. But as of now, we're 100% on board for leasing it. And the, the thing with the outlot was where if we're going to actively try to lease it, we need to have parking for somebody. So if a Dollar General or a, we got a Planet Fitness at one of our other facilities and they require almost 200 parking spots. So if we, it had to be one or the other, you know. In this, this way, if 28,000 square feet, if we can get a Dollar General or what may not be here already, there's enough parking spaces to accommodate that kind of retail company. And my other question was just if you had anyone in mind that worked well for your I don't situation. Know. I'm open to, but... you know, we're open to anything. So okay. as long as another storage place doesn't come in, I think we're all happy. <laughs> <laughs> but I will say, and we talked last time about Baraboo. We're currently in the process of signing a lease with Goodwill. That happened on my way here today. So we've had a few, lots of people looking the Baraboo ones, but those are set lease spots that we had there. But we are getting some traction, and now that we're in the, the Kmart there, we're actually getting some traction on bringing some leases into those areas. I have to say that I have some uh, concerns about the truck bodies. And that's why I asked if sure. there was an installation around that uh, had been, that was available to be seen. I, I mean, we have some. So it's been a program of ours for well, 20 years now. We have some in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. They look nothing like what we're doing these days with screening them or anything like that. I mean, we pretty much take the box, which is built separate from the truck, put it on the ground, shim it up, secure it down, and then we'll skin it to make it look like one building. In the past, we just put them on the ground. So your idea of a truck box on the ground, that's exactly what they look like in the past. So these ones, if you look at the pictures, will look completely like a building. I give a shout out for reusing. Yeah, um, but the other sustainability thought, right, is the dead space, I guess, between your skin and the box. Like, is oh, it's mounted right there. Yeah, so the, the, the metal siding will be mounted directly to the box. Essentially, a door, which is all you see. It's like a garage essentially, door. Yeah. essentially, all you'll see is the back of the door that's like currently on door. the truck right now. Yep, yeah. and they reskin it to take all the normal U-Haul graphics off the back. So we reskin it just to make it look orange. Other questions? I don't think anybody has any other questions. Awesome. Well, I'm available if you have any. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. 
Now we're going to move to the conditional use permit uh, discussion for outdoor dining at 110 East Mineral Street. So the, the 110 East Mineral Street, that is the, the VFW Tavern, um, <coughs> they have a situation now where, I don't know if you go by there, they have a bench kind of on the south side of the building where if people want to smoke, they have to go outside nowadays. So uh, they would like to have the ability for someone to go outside. They could also take a beer with them if they so desired. So they would like to have a, a beer garden um, on that location of their property, which requires a conditional use permit. So what they would do is uh, install a, a fence uh, area uh, on that area. It would be about 22 by 30. Uh, there's the existing door that goes into the building. Then they'd have a gate on the uh, kind of the southeast portion of the fence and the uh, west portion of the fence for access into the, that location. And then they'd have picnic tables and the like in there. The, the fence would be a metal fence similar to across the street at the, it's now the gym or they don't want it quite as tall as that, so it'd be uh, a, little, a little bit closer to the parking lot right behind me, or there's a similar fence also by the Jenner Tower parking lot, but it'd be that same same style is what they're considering. Um, they're not sure exactly the, the height, but at least four feet and no taller than six feet. Um, if you look on the, the information, there's a, a picture of the back so basically there's two handicap spaces um, on the south side of that building. They would lose the one farthest uh, to the east and that's where the fence would start and it would kind of go over to basically that flagpole on the other part. Um, it would stop a couple of feet short of the sidewalk so it wouldn't impact uh, pedestrians walking along the front of the property. Uh, but that's the general area that they would like to install uh, this beer garden. And as I mentioned, it does require a condition use permit, so that's why it's here. Uh, the plan commission considered it and did recommend approval. Um, the following conditions would be, uh, the fence would be a, max, a minimum four feet high, maximum of six feet high. And there was a discussion about uh, making sure customers realize that they cannot take their alcoholic beverages onto the street. So the plan commission is recommending a sign be placed on the fence, reminding <laughs> customers that alcoholic beverages shall remain within the fenced area. Any questions? Yeah. Um, so, are they going to replace that one handicap space, or does the ADA require it? Or if, if they have a need for it, the space again in that picture, uh, basically all that parking to the east of the building is also VFW's parking. Mm -hmm. So that space right by the flagpole would be designated as a handicap space. But is there a certain number of how many you need? It's based on the, the ratio. There's a ratio of the total number of parking spaces that are provided. I don't think they need to. I think they just provided to. Um, is there a way for us to check it to make sure before we vote on this? Um, sure. Okay. Yeah. I'd be interested in that. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. And, this, and the fence would be not at the curb. Correct. The fence would be back. And it's back even from the sidewalk. If that sidewalk were to extend, it's actually asphalt where the sidewalk would be. They're back from there. So basically, it, it's approximately uh, back where the uh, the parking space ends, just a little bit beyond that. So would they intend to put new sidewalk in then? And uh, would No, the they... existing hard surfacing would remain. they just uh, install the fence. they just install that the area. fence. And... How about any greenery or planters or some kind of? Um, they're not proposing any, but I did tell them that would probably be a point of discussion. And the picnic tables, I can't remember. Did we specify the kind of picnic tables in the other? across the road at the gym did we I, I think it stated that they either had to match the fence in color or the building in color and ended up doing wood uh, to match the building siding if I okay. recall correctly okay I'm just a little concerned about picnic tables that start to peel and what kind of 
Any other questions about? Yes, I have some questions. Okay. Um, music. Are there, are, there going, are there going to be bands coming to this location? Uh, I am not the correct person to answer that question, um, but there there are part of our zoning ordinance kind of general standards. There are limits built into uh, the code as far as the hours of operation for any outdoor music, so that would apply to the situation. Well, that was another question. What what time can they start? You have the ending times. When can they start? That, that is not addressed in the ordinance. It's not addressed in this 2206. Right. But that is a condition that could be placed on the approval. Uh, previously, we've had a complaint about noise coming from this area. And so I'm concerned about this. Um, is there any requirement as far as the decibel level of noise leaving the property of this business? No, we don't have any of that limit in our ordinance now. Well, it says here it's all outdoor loudspeakers should be or oriented away from the abutting residential uses. But in my opinion, there still can be a lot of noise going into the residential and it can go for a long distance. So the noise factor is one of my concerns. Thank you. Any other questions? I guess we'll move on. The next item on the agenda is a PUD amendment for 555 North Chestnut Street and 530 North Court Street. Joe? So this is the, uh, the former Gray's Nursing Home uh, property on Chestnut Street. And that, that property was uh, recently sold and it included um, three, actually three different properties, 555 North Chestnut Street, which was the nursing home property itself. There was a, a three unit building immediately to the east of that at 540 North Court and then another single family rental at, at 530 North Court. Um, so that had already been approved. They combined the lots. There was an issue with the lot line through the building and the, the approval was to allow that building to be converted to a four unit apartment building. So at that time, they kind of just had a, a general conceptual layout of the building, how that apartment building would work and, and actually locate the units within that building so after they had their architect um, and uh, take a look at it and figure out how the utilities were going to work and meet the building codes and so forth they realized that they uh, could actually get more bedrooms that they than they had initially anticipated in there um, they thought initially they'd have five now they think they can get eight and then they're proposing to take one of the units that was originally anticipated to be a, a large two bedroom unit. And instead they're proposing to divide that into two one bedroom units. Um, basically it's a, the larger unit where the, the building owner applicant is currently living. Um, at some point they would move out and then that would be uh, rented out space. So the request basically is to take the, the four bedroom, five unit or four unit, five bedroom, building and instead approve it for a, a five bedroom eight five unit eight bedroom uh, apartment building but it would all take place within the existing build layout so there'd be no basically exterior changes to that building other than you know they'll add some doors and windows but uh, no additions no larger footprint uh, would be provided so to accommodate that additional uh, bedrooms um, they are proposing to install a, a parking lot on the, the property just south of the house at 530 North Court Street. So there's an existing curb cut coming off of Court Street at that location. So at some point in the past, there must have been a driveway, uh, probably a garage for that house. Right now, it's just a, <coughs> a open area. They would install a parking lot. They would probably get a, a nine stall parking lot at that location. And then they would have a, a sidewalk that would go from that parking lot over to the apartment building. So that would be the parking for uh, the, this uh, apartment building. 
they also <coughs> have the existing driveway to the north side of the apartment building that can remain and be used as parking. It, it also serves kind of as a, a sidewalk or access point to each of the apartment buildings. So they feel they'll need some additional parking elsewhere, and that's the reason for that uh, proposed parking. So they would have enough uh, uh, parking for at least one stall per bedroom, um, which is more than what our code requires. So um, that should take care of the parking concerns. But it is a modification to what was previously approved, so it does require uh, amendment. Any questions? So no changes to 530 or 540 North Court Street, just a building on Chestnut? Uh, correct. Then it would just be on the property where the 530 is for the, the parking, so there'd be site changes, but the, the structures themselves would not change. My question is, um, how many adults could occupy these units total? In other words, so uh, I can think of an example of a one bedroom and two people live, two adults in a one bedroom, so they need, they have two cars. So here they have one car per unit. So what's the potential as far as adults in these units? Did, have you figured that out? No, I don't, I don't know for sure the size of the bedrooms, <laughs> if they would all be large enough to accommodate more than one person. But otherwise, you know, theoretically, you, know, you could get two people in a, in a bedroom if they're large enough. So I'm just curious, just because we've had other people talk about this before in other properties, and I'm trying to go with the Google Maps and figure out exactly how this works. Um, but I know that there was a concern last time with adding additional concrete that the water absorption would become an issue and flooding would be a thing. Is that a perceived thing here? Like I said, I don't to see the properties, so I can't tell right now, but um, I was just curious, yeah. Someone, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I know the, <laughs> the applicant's got an engineer working okay? on his site okay. plan, Microphone. so. Uh, Michael Strolz, 555 North Chestnut Street. Nice to see everybody again. It feels like almost a weekly thing. Do you want me to answer that question first? Or do you want me to go down my whole rundown? Um, it, it doesn't matter. Whatever you want. Yeah. Okay, I'll kind of hit your question first, then I'll do my rundown, sure. and then if you have additional questions, let me know. Okay. So um, I'm going to touch on that when I kind of hit back at the parking, because there's a little, I don't want to say a change, but some stuff different with sure. the parking that I want to bring up to the council this evening. Uh, but we, we have an engineer that's working on the water shutoff to figure out how we're going to do it. We've also had rural excavating over there, talking about how they'd want to pitch it for any water uh, removal from the property. We've also had uh, the plumber that we've engaged for the property, Bill's Plumbing, has looked at uh, working with the engineer because we have to have state approved plans for this since we're changing the zoning of the property of putting a drain in the parking lot and then running the drain underground and tiring, uh, tying it into the sewer system, which seems to be the common practice of what's done for the watershed. <clears throat> so we're uh, still in the middle of kind of doing the site plan for the parking and that's why some of those things like we have a general idea what mm -hmm. we want to do but it is being taken under consideration sure. Sure. can I circle back okay circling back so um, you guys should have the packet that was given to the Planning Commission right yes okay so in that plan uh, packet uh, I'm just gonna just address the unit thing first uh, basically, like Joe said, when we initially put the proposal in, uh, it was with the idea that we wanted commitment from the city that we could do it before we invested a ton of time in floor plan layouts, etc. Uh, after we engaged uh, K&D Engineering out of Dodgeville to help us with uh, state approved plans, which we do need to have for this project, um, it was deemed that we could, um, with taking in the two things that were most uh, important to the city and the state, which is ADA accessibility and parking, we could get five units in that property instead of the four. Initially, we wanted to do the, the unit number four as a larger one bedroom, uh, partially because my wife and I were owner occupying it at the time. But uh, after dealing with K&D engineering, not only was that kind of deemed to be, pardon the expression, stupid, uh, we'd have to go through a second state approval process if we ever wanted to make changes to that unit to make it conforming at the time. So it just made sense to do everything at once. <clears throat> um, again, we're not changing the footprint of the property, and uh, I'm sure Mr. Shanley can back me on this. Uh, if you have a three to four unit bedroom, which that probably would have been in the back, those are much harder to rent in Platteville, especially in complexes, than one and two bedrooms um, in complexes. It's, it's just the way the market is. 
Um, they, they tend to rent better. They tend to be more attractive to people and they, they usually produce a better income on the property. They make the property look better. Um, as far as changing um, that to the adding the fifth unit, we don't even have to have to add an extra door for that. The back part of the building is actually perfectly set up for that and the AD accessibility because it was a nursing home. So it's already all set up for that. The only doors that would need to be added are for the two front units to create ADA accessibility. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now to the uh, elephant in the room with parking. Um, parking always seems to be a hot button issue whenever we have these discussions. Um, Initially, when we turned the uh, plan into Joe and we decided that uh, we were going to need appropriate parking for uh, the, the complex, um, once we found out the driveway would not work as the original PUD had set, um, initially had set up, that was mostly due that after we had the CSM done, combining 555 North Chestnut and 540 Court and removing the property line, we realized that what we wanted to use in the driveway for a lot of parking, we didn't quite have as much real estate as we had anticipated, especially when Joe and I went and measured it off. Jeez, it's got to be a year ago. So as a result, because I view myself as somebody, as a landlord, contractor, whatever you want to call me, that I don't want to skirt the parking thing. I know a lot of uh, developers and landlords will try to skirt the parking, do minimal parking, jam it in any way they can, call bedrooms offices so they don't have to have a parking stall for it. I don't want to do that. I want to be as completely forthright as I can. So um, with us resurfacing that driveway and bringing it up in grade so that it meets the doors for the property to code, we can get three to four parking stalls in that driveway. And I'm pretty sure we can get it where cars can get around each other if they're parallel parked. But I want to make sure that we meet the minimum requirements for par code requirements because that's how we should be looking at this is the code requirements for the property. The code requires that we have eight parking stalls, one per bedroom in the property. When we did the initial plan to Joe, we said, well, we can fit if we had to nine at 530 court with the existing curb cut plus an additional three to four in the driveway that's existing already at the gray site, which if we maxed it out would put us at 13 stalls, which is way more than what we need according to the code. Since then, the engineer has been playing with parking lot layouts because I have the same concern a lot of the council does. I don't wanna get rid of green space. I wanna have good curb appeal and I want things to fit neighborhoods well. and. Looking at this with the engineer of how we want to have the parking lot layout, if we choose not to do the rough draft that I provided to the council, I don't want to, pardon the expression, pave paradise to put up a parking lot. Um, there's a lot of green space back there that we want to take advantage of. We do want to be kind of trendsetters when it comes to developers uh, putting in, uh, we want to put a fire pit back there and some uh, very tastefully done outdoor furniture and a barbecue and stuff for tenants to use at the Grace facility. So we'd like to keep as much green space as we can. Additionally, I saw Miss Nichols drive by this evening, so I assume others have. There's two great big oak trees in the backyard of that property, beautiful 100-year-old oak trees. We're going to try to save both those trees. If we have to stick to the nine spots at the 530 court, there's a chance we may have to take one of those trees down. But if we did, say, seven, which I think we can fit in there, the engineer is sending a survey out, I think, sometime next week, we're still meeting and exceeding the code requirements, but then we're saving the big tree and it keeps the whole neighborhood looking nicer, good curb appeal. We'll still do landscaping around it, but it won't be a new sapling stuck down. It's actually an old tree that looks like an old neighborhood. Um, we'd still meet the code requirements by doing that and without you know, giving us, an, uh, I guess, the ability to kind of play with the layout to get it to work right, make sure the watershed's right and all those things, we'll still meet the code requirements because this is a state approved project. So the state has to come in when it's all said and done, give me an occupancy permit or I can't put people in it. And Joe and Mr. Rineker will come and probably be very upset with me if I don't meet the requirements either. So what we're looking at right now is, you know, we can get nine, maybe it'll be seven. Um, it depends on how the survey comes out, but we know that we'll meet at least the minimum, if not trying to exceed by a parking stop, spot or two, the requirement because I like to be an overachiever. Anybody have any questions? So, Mike, so your <clears throat> so the proposed parking that you have on your on your lot here, or the survey, you've got the parking stalls facing to the south or the southwest. Yep. Any chance of facing those the other way? They could be faced the other way, but then for sure we're going to have an issue with the tree. And from a look standpoint, if the way that when you're driving down the street, and I'm sure you have that, it kind of pitches a little bit down off the street. If you're kind of putting them towards the way they are on there, it kind of camouflages the parking lot a little bit. 
If you're putting them towards the house, they're going to be more noticeable from the street. They are definitely going to cause an issue with you not being able to see the tree, possibly having to remove the tree. And frankly, uh, my wife would probably kill me. I actually used to live at 530 Court Street for about so 15, it's for 15 years. So um, <laughs> the only reason I ask is that way, if you were to pull one there, your car or the vehicles, tenants' cars or vehicles would be parked or facing your property and not to the property that's towards the south and to the southwest. Um, that'd be the only question I would have. I mean, you know, it, just for it, headlight stuff. So, I mean, if you want to have them in there, but, but there's a, there's a giant dog ear fence there. Yep, I know that's, where that's yep. seven foot. So the headlights shouldn't be an issue because it's going to reflect off the fence. Sure. Um, so I'm not overly worried about that. And if we had to put some vegetation down there, I recently just cut down a ton of overgrown vegetation, but we'd have no problem putting some back up to kind of address that issue. Um, I want to keep it as green and as nice as we can. I want to do landscaping around it. My wife wants to plant some uh, bushes that kind of camouflage it again. She's not a big parking lot fan. So we want to do what we can to kind of camouflage it into the neighborhood and still have the neighborhood keep its old feel. Then you're going to leave the parking lot or the driveway on five 540 what north court 540 north court will stay the same because it is grandfathered in um it already has adequate parking for there so it's just going to stay at 555 north court we are going to widen and raise the driveway about three inches um and then resurface it just because it needs to be done it's in terrible condition and that way the driveway will slope right up to the doors <laughs> which will all be on the driveway side there on the north uh for all the ada accessibility so they can just roll right in if they need to Going back to the fence a minute um, on 530 North Court, yeah. is that fence owned? Is it on your property or is it on the neighbor's property? I'm, we didn't have a CSM done on that property. I'm fairly sure it's the neighbor's property's the neighbor's, fence, so it's but, it, but it, fence. Does, it does go the entire property line. Yeah. And if there was ever an issue with that, say the neighbor came and said, I want it, that's a rental unit next, next mm -hmm. door there. I'm fairly certain it's a duplex or a triplex. If the neighbor ever wanted to take it down, we would or immediately offer to put something up ourselves just because that would be the right thing to do. At this point, it makes no sense to put two fences backing right next to each other up. It's kind of overkill. No, yeah, I was thinking more in terms of what Isaac said, which is the headlights. Mm -hmm. As long as there's a fence, that definitely helps. And then 530 North Court, is that a single family zoning? It, or yes, it is a single family. It is a single family. So the individuals, let's say there are four in that single family. Four there, cars, there's, let's just say four cars, okay? And so you're, you you're saying 540 or 530? 530. 530, the blue house. Yes. Okay. So with if you so you far. So you to four individuals, as Ken was saying earlier, and you have four cars in that house. And four bedrooms. Okay. If you have four adults in 530 North Court. I don't, you'd never fit four in there. Okay. Ever. It's a small house. Uh, well, maybe yeah, Isaac the, did back in the day. The question is whether or okay. not you could have. Okay. You know, depending on the size of the bedrooms, as Joe's talking okay. about. I'm just trying to get a sense of how many cars you could conceivably have in 530 North Court and then also in 555 Chestnut because it appears you have enough parking for 540 North Court on, on the lot, right? The triplex? I have more than ample parking for 540, Okay, yes. so you have enough on the triplex. Yep. Okay, so I, I'm just trying to see where seven to nine stalls with eight units or eight bedrooms in the uh, Chestnut mm -hmm. property and I don't know, two or three or four bedrooms in the other one. Um, I know... I know you're not required to have a car or a parking spot per bedroom, but there are some rules about how many you do have to have. So I'm just wondering how you're going to have enough. Well, I'm looking at 530 court two different ways. If, if okay. we want to start with 530 court. 530 court, I'm looking at one, it, it is a grandfathered in property as far as the parking requirements go per the code. Now, I don't want to ignore that because I figured you guys wouldn't let me ignore that, which is why we're going to you know shoot for if we can't do nine, like seven spots in that parking lot because that is taking that property into consideration for additional parking if necessary. Um, if I was coming back here and saying, I want eight and I'm gonna jam four in that driveway and do a four, four stall parking lot out front and yay, everybody has to approve it because that's what the ordinance says, that would be kind of rude on my part. What I'm trying to say is I wanna fit that parking lot, what I can fit in there to make it work and take that property into consideration. 540 Court actually has a, an extra parking spot in it because you can get four in that driveway and those are all one bedrooms. So I could make the argument 530 court could use 540 courts parking stall if needed so there's a little bit of musical chairs there and that's why i don't want to do the eight because i don't want to do the eight but it may not be the nine in that lot it may be the seven because i don't want to take the tree down either and i would hope you guys wouldn't want me to take down a hundred year old oak tree that's not sick dying or looking at uh, doing some damage to a property 
And then the other question, I, I would um, echo what Sina said. There's quite a drop, really, in that backyard at mm -hmm. 530, and the ranch dial home is sitting sure. right, right <coughs> below it, so to speak. And so I don't know if the ranch dial home has had water issues in the past, even just already. And so to put paved area, and that's and why, and that's why the engineers are involved. Yeah, They're going to deal with the, the, the Candy Engineering is working with Rural Excavating because mm -hmm, I've mm -hmm. known them since I was so tall. And uh, Bill Bill's Plumbing did all the the original plumbing on the Gray's facility from start to finish. So um, they're going to act as the plumber on the project already engaged. So either it's going to be a sloping issue where we get it sloped even towards the nursing home if necessary. We just put new sump facilities in there and the front portion of the nursing home is actually just on um, footers. So there's even a basement under the front half of it. So we can absorb the water issue, no pun intended, uh, on our end. But we're also looking at if we wanted to put a drain in that parking lot and pitch it out towards the street, how would we make that happen? And we may have to engage the, the neighbor to do that. Uh, we're not quite to that point yet, but that is, has been a kind of brief discussion. Well, um my uh, concern is that this is on two lots and uh, I think that it was expressed at the plan commission that there would have to be some type of permanent easement because I think uh, while uh, the parking lot I mean this is kind of unusual that the parking lot for one lot is being provided on a non connected lot Sure, but that's why we would do the permanent easement that goes with right. the property. So, we talked about that in the planning right. commission. Talked to, I don't think we talked about it tonight, though. No, no, no. And, and I was so, actually going to bring that up next. You beat me right. to the punch. I beat you to that. Uh, because I wouldn't want that to become an issue. I, you know, I don't, I don't think you're probably going to own this for 200 years. No, but <laughs> at least I hope I would live that long. <laughs> when we did the CSM and combined 540 Court and 555 North Chestnut, that was to remove the property line. We intentionally left 530 <laughs> Court off from several standpoints. One, it just didn't need to be included at the time. Two, if we ever wanted to parcel one off, such as 530 Court, we could. However, how a standard easement process works in a situation like that, the I'm granting an easement to myself. They have to go permanently with the properties, and the burden basically falls on me because if I ever go to sell the property, not only do I have to disclose the easement, it may be prohibitive from somebody ever wanting to buy it because the easement is there. More than likely, I would sell the property before I'm 200 years old, probably as one complex or whatever you'd want to call it. But the easement is more or less my burden to deal with down the road because I did grant it to myself so I can kick myself 50 years down the road when I'm an old man saying, why did I do that? Additional questions? Okie dokie. Yeah. Thanks, folks. Thanks, Mike. Okay, now we'll move on to the next item, another PUD. This would be a PUD amendment for the Cedar Hills condominiums at 325-355 Wait Lane. Joe? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Yes, the, the condominiums there have already been approved. They're proposed a combination of single-family uh, condominium units and duplex <laughs> condominium <laughs> units. And what they're, they found they just uh, put up a new one of the duplex condominium buildings the first one that they've done and they sold it and they were pleased with that but a lot of the comments that they received were from people looking at it was yeah this is a two-story building we want something a little smaller that's one story um, and basically just enough for a, a master bedroom on the main floor and possibly some bedrooms in, in the basement if needed so they've kind of redesigned their proposed duplex model and since it is a little bit smaller than what they had originally planned on building, they're asking for uh, approval to uh, kind of amend their uh, their building layout on the property. So previously, and there's a, a site plan that kind of shows um, how they had proposed to lay this out, but they had originally proposed um, the units 12 and 13, uh, those two lots would be one duplex and then units 14 and 15 would be one duplex but since they're those buildings are not going to be as big as they thought the footprint will be a lot smaller they won't take up the equivalent of four lots within that development so what they're pro proposing to do is take the the lots where units 13 14 and 15 were originally going to be proposed and make that into the two duplex units 
and then units 12 would still be available for a single family lot so the the end result is they'd have one additional condominium unit on the property than what was originally constructed so it would, it would raise the the condo unit count to 18. so basically the the lots the duplex lots are getting a little bit smaller because of the the building itself would be smaller and then they would have room for an additional single family unit. So that is their proposal. Um, other than that, the, the rest of the development would obviously remain uh, the same. Any questions? Uh, I should point out that they had all already gotten permission to use six and seven as a duplex lot, right? in an earlier six and seven i mean i think earlier when yes they came, right they had six and seven as a duplex lot and uh, then just 12 to and the 13 and 14 and 15. so they had taken six lots and made duplex lots out of those six right. now they're and then the, and the there's unit no change four. on six and seven now or is, does this um, also they're I think they're, at this point they're going to say that's still going to be a duplex, but um, they're kind of wait and see how the how these units are received um, before they make a final decision. The unit four, which is kind of on the other side of the road from these two proposals, is where they just built the uh, duplex uh, condos, and that's a, a two-story unit. It's small footprint, but it's two stories. And um, as I mentioned, they they seem to be getting a lot of feedback that they want to everything on one one level so they're changing their their footprint and it, it it by keeping it on a smaller footprint it also allows them to keep the the cost down so it's kind of hitting a sweet spot in the market i think if they can stay within under that 200,000 price tag okay any question any other questions on this PUD amendment Okay, then let's move on to F. This would be about the city hall renovation phases one and two. And we have uh, I will be filling a contract. In. And Karen will be uh, acting tonight. Yep. I will be filling in for Howard, who had to be absent. Um, so a few meetings ago, um, we had uh, reviewed uh, bidding for phase one work of the city hall remodel, which is expected to take place in three phases over three years. We only had one bidder for that work, uh, for that work and based on feedback that we had gotten, um, uh, we had made the recommendation and the council agreed that we would rebid uh, phase one and phase two together. So for the work that was going to be completed in 2019 and 2020, um, and so we did receive the, the bids for um, the revised bid package. We had four bidders. And um, based on the results, J squared construction would be um, the low bidder um, with a combined uh, for phase one and phase two of $490,328. Um, which is, uh, it's particularly in phase one, there was a substantial savings from the original um, bid that we had received. Um, Howard has done some revised estimates of the total project costs because when we revised the bid package, we did include some work that, um, uh, that we would do, it, uh, the staff would do, particularly with respect to trim and doors that had been originally part of the bid package. Um, and so it's looking at, I don't I don't think I have my, oh, here it is. Um, that, that really roughly with the rebidding of the package as with both years together, that we would now be able to afford to do, to cover the furniture costs, which previously had been an unbudgeted expense. Um, and that's uh, roughly $65,000. And when I say furniture, I don't mean office furniture. What I'm really talking about are the modular workstations. Um, which are not going to be reusable um, from our old space. Okay, questions on the bids or the totals or because we're going to go right from this into a city hall renovations update. 
And Tammy uh, Black is here if uh, oh anyone had uh, detailed questions about the, the yeah. bids. Well, you mentioned that city staff is going to help with some of the installation. Are they going to be there right away when the contractors are ready for them? Or do the contractor has to wait for city staff through this process? I'm just curious. Uh, I, I mean, certainly the goal is not to have the contractor wait. So most of the work that city staff would be doing would be what I would call finish work. Um, and so generally it's the contractor will have completed really the majority of their work before we come in to do that finish work. I don't know if you would concur with that, Tammy, or, yeah, yes. Because we all know what it's like when a contractor doesn't have all their staff at the appropriate time, and that just delays the project and costs more money. So um, knowing that we're using state, or state, pardon me, city staff, I want to make sure that they're available when the contractor needs them. Uh, so that's my question. Yeah. So the contractor will really have completed their work and then uh, city staff, uh, uh, Shannon, our building maintenance specialist, would come in and do some of the trim finishing and door installation. So it shouldn't delay anything with the contractor. It could conceivably delay how quickly city staff move from the swing space into the new space. Well, we'll see. Any other questions? I have a question, I just don't know when to time it. Um, I'm just, I, has, this has gone by historic preservation, correct? <coughs> or what elements do we know remain and what elements may be lost? So the, the, the part that's really for historic significance is, is really the, the lobby, the foyer area, and that will be unchanged on the first and second floor. Um, once you get to the interior offices where the majority of this work is being done, a lot of that has been remodeled in the past. So our goal is to try and preserve some of the original elements that still exist. Um, so we're going to try where there is still, like for example in my office there's still some original trim. So we're, as we remodel that we're going to try and match that existing trim. Um, if we're able to, in some of the areas that have terrazzo floor, we're going to try and repair that floor so it can still be used. Um, but generally, the areas that are impacted by this remodel, uh, the historic standards wouldn't apply, and they've been previously remodeled already. I don't know if that, you would agree with that. You, please come on. I'm Tammy Black with Delta 3 Engineering. So the this did go through a review process with the State Historic Preservation Office as well. So they approved it, our design, and our changes that we're making because they aren't in that character defining area, that main stair area. Um, and so they approved it without questions. And then I also reviewed it with the HPC to let them know kind of what we're doing. And we're trying to uncover, like, like Karen said, some of that terrazzo floor and keep the historic trim work and also kind of open up some of the ceilings so you can see a little bit more of what was there. So we're trying to be sensitive to it. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other questions? Sierra, are you ready? Uh, well, did you register to speak? Why don't we uh, hear from Sierra, and if you uh, have things you want to say after that, give me a registration. Okay, Sierra. Hi, I'm Sierra Cooper. Um, I'm a junior at UW Platteville, and I'm also Karen's intern this um, spring semester and during the summer. And I'm here just to give an update on the City Hall renovation project. So some reasons that the City Hall is being remodeled is there was an aging HVAC system, there was poor indoor air quality, staff, um, staff efficiency will increase, um, we're going from five public reception areas down to two, 
we're going to consolidate staff and there's going to be increased security in the building. So phase one of the remodeling project begins in July 2019. New HVAC ductwork and rooftop units will be installed. The office of the city manager on the south side of the first floor will be renovated and this will become the location of the finance team in the future. So the new locations of the offices. In May and June, the second floor staff, which includes parks and recreation, public works, the housing authority and community development, and the city's manager's office will move to the former police station in the east part of the building. Residents can access these doors, or these offices, from doors on Mineral Street. The finance and water sewer staff will stay in their existing location until the work is done. Um, here are the move dates. So community development will move from May 20th to May 31st. The city manager and the city clerk will move from June 3rd to June 14th. And public works and park re parks and recreation will move from June 17th to June 28th. Phase two of the renovation project will begin in 2020 with the build out of the second floor. The current GAR room will be a new reception area for the floor. This office of the city manager, city clerk, administration, community development, recreation, and, park, and public works will be located on the second floor. And phase three of the remodeling project will begin in 2021. And this will involve the current finance offices being renovated into a large conference room and will also be the new location of the housing authority. The estimated cost of the renovation is $750,000 and the project is spread out over three years so the project does not add any additional debt. And these are some of the signs for um, the new entrances during the swing space. Um, North one will be where you can access the city manager um, public works, parks and recreation, and things like that. North 2 will be the housing authority. And then N5 is the handicap accessible entrance that is there right now, and you'll use that door to access council chambers and the auditorium. And so the, um, here's some of our communications plan. There's a news release that went out on April 29th. The city hall remodel page on, Pla um, on the Platteville website will be updated continuously. Social media will be continued to be updated. There was a 53818 update story. We'll have signs on the doors um, leading to the offices. There will be maps on easels located in lobbies. There will be sandwich board signs outside the doors and located in front of the main doors right now. There will be TV channel updates and there should be a water bill utility insert that went out in the May water bill. So the things that are not moving, finance and water and sewer will be in, ex in its existing location until late 2019. Entrance to the auditorium council, chamber, council chambers will remain the same until late 2019. And access to all these locations will be through the handicap accessible door on Mineral Street and through the main doors on Bronson Street. And that's all I have, are there any questions? Yeah. One thing we haven't talked about is Bathrooms. Are the bathrooms being remodeled? And will the bathrooms be accessible? I mean, as soon as this construction starts in July, we have music in the park on Thursday nights, and I believe the city hall is open during that time. And I think it's also open on Saturday mornings when the farmer's market is on part of the square. And the primary reason for that is the bathrooms. Yes. So, I mean, we talked about everything else, but we didn't talk about bathrooms. I don't believe that the bathrooms will be renovated. I think everything will stay the same for that. And so there will be access to the bathrooms yes. through this summer, and even, even though there's construction. Yes. Okay. Any other questions? Are, are you using the main door that the police department used to, when N1 and N2... When you, those pictures, I couldn't tell. Is one of them the former main police door? N1 is? Yeah. yeah I just couldn't. N1 is, yes. Yeah, I just couldn't tell. If, yeah. If I go back, you can see it better on this slide. Whoops. N1 is the main door, and then N2, and then N5 is the door on the very right hand of the picture. Okay. Any other questions of Sierra? Thank you. Thank you. All right, Jack has uh, 
asked to speak and ask a question. Sorry for the intrusion. Uh, Jack Ludke, I'm the executive director for the Platteville Main Street program. And I was looking at the uh, plan on the website uh, that was posted. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe uh, the plan indicated that in the first phase there would be uh, rooftop air conditioning units uh, replaced. And I was wondering, does that also include air conditioning for the auditorium? It does not. It does not. It does not. Was that considered? It was. And I assume it's money that it's not being done? Yes. Okay. Well, uh, just from a standpoint of the use of that auditorium, and we had to use it a couple times last summer for rain dates for music in the park, and it's basically unusable when it's really hot and uh, so that's why I was just wondering if that was in the plan if we're already doing something here um, you know couldn't it have been considered you know I'm sure that we'd take a donation okay <laughs> <laughs> so we should start to a make, fund drive to make that possible so right? we just need to know the number <laughs> right and we 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 did look at that. I mean, obviously, we'd love to have the auditorium uh, air conditioned as well, but it just wasn't financially feasible given the constraints of what we were trying to accomplish. Um, but we we do have an estimate of of what that would cost. I don't have it at my fingertips, but um, we can uh, get that from Tammy. You, had, uh, you know, a donation is not out of the question. I know we're considering, and you're going to talk about it again tonight, the new building at Legion Park and the community supports those kinds of things and the air conditioning of the auditorium has been waiting for a long time so I think to properly use that and utilize that space which has been renovated and is a great space for the city to use um, you know maybe that's our next major project thank you thank you I just want to note reminder the proclamation that we began at the beginning of the meeting and the conversation about economic development and that we do recognize that those all are tied into what you're saying so um, I, I also think that we had the conversation about it not necessarily um, having to be undone and costing us a lot more to bring that air conditioning in later they're kind of two separate projects. Is that correct? Um, Do you remember? Yes, I see Tammy nodding her head. Yes. Okay. What did you say? Well, just that if we aren't doing it at the exact same time as all of the other HVAC stuff, we weren't going to cost ourselves a lot more money later to address the auditorium. That they were looking to be kind of two separate projects. So, so if the people that might contribute a fundraiser it won't be an issue they can there's there's nothing we're doing as part of this project that would compromise or okay. increase the cost to add air conditioning okay. to the auditorium at a later date okay any other questions then thanks again Sierra we'll move on to the Legion Park Event Center proposed design and location yes Is that you Luke that's me um, so it's my pleasure to introduce to you the uh, proposed uh, Legion Park Event Center. Um, this uh, is a project that is a private citizen group um, that is working on designing, fundraising, and constructing a building that would replace the existing art hall and uh, restroom facilities, which are called the Warming House in Legion Park. Um, those buildings would be uh, coming down um, because they're, they're not seen as reflecting well upon the city. Um, so this started out as an option that we uh, presented to, um, we, we welcomed everyone to a committee or to a uh, public meeting um, where we presented an option to renovate or replace those two facilities. Out of that, this committee was formed. They quickly decided that replacement was the uh, best option and uh, the direction they wanted to uh, move forward with. Um, once it's constructed, though, the building would be gifted to the city. Um, which is why it's being uh, brought before you today. Um, obviously, it's also being located in one of our parks. 
Um, the building, once gifted, would be uh, rented out to public and private groups. Um, so it would be an event center um, for uh, community fest festivals, for um, graduation parties, uh, things like that. Um, we would collect fees from that rental to help offset the uh, um, cost of maintenance and utilities on that building um, so it doesn't become a, a taxpayer uh, burden. Um, in your packet, you'll notice we have three different papers for you um, talking about the design. I'll go over the elevation one first, which is the, uh, um, the building pictures with the red roof on it, the side views. Um, the top picture there is the north, then the, the second picture is the south, east, and west. Um, so it's looking at the top picture on the north there, um, that would be facing um, uh, away from Pitt Street. Um, essentially that's the back of the building. So there's not a whole lot of detail there that I need to go over other than pointing out that on either side of our uh, uh, building or on our, uh, um, uh, where our kitchen and storage area is, there would be screened in areas for our rooftop or for our units. Um, they're called a rooftop unit, but they're gonna be located on the ground. Um, so they're in fenced areas there. Uh, the next picture down, the second one down from the top is probably the more interesting one. That's our south um, elevation. Um, this would essentially be our entrance to the building, um, which would face Pitt Street. Um, it does have uh, four doors um, on the front to allow larger crowds to enter or exit the building at one time. Um, directly inside of there is a uh, common space, um, which would then feed into two separate or what could become two separate uh, event spaces. Um, so we are keeping it open to have a larger event space that could be divided into two depending on our, our needs if we have one group or uh, two groups. Um, other thing worth pointing out on that picture is that there is an option of a stone front on there. Um, so around the, uh, the bottom four feet in some additional columns there, there are drawn in uh, stone on the front of that building which would be an optional or would be an option for us. Uh, the next picture is the east um, elevation. This is the side that would face the uh, newly paved uh, uh, main parking lot in Legion Park. Um, you'll notice on there there is a large barn door um, that's to allow um, people to access through that um, and also allow it to become more of an indoor outdoor space with those barn doors opened. Um, so it does have barn door and then actually it has a screen door and then a garage door. So there's, there's multiple layers to that door um, partially to give it a, a nice barn look. Um, which was one of the things the committee really wanted to achieve. Um, the final uh, picture there is our west side. Um, this is the side that would face towards our horseshoe courts um, or uh, Second Street area. Um, off of that end is a uh, outdoor canopy similar to what, what is currently up there at, at Legion Park, a canopy that could be used uh, either rented as a portion of the building, rented separately from the building, or used on a first come first serve basis without uh, um, renting any of the building. Um, so that is the elevation. I'll have you flip over next to our um, uh, floor plan layout and I'm going to take a moment just to flip my uh, board around. All right, this I believe is the next uh, drawing that's in your packet. Um, this is the uh, proposed layout for the center. Um, as you can see off to our, our south is our entrance area. Um, again, that is a common entrance with two separate doors that then lead into what would be a 6,000 square foot um, uh, event space. And again, that is because there is going to be the possibility of using an air wall to divide um, that into two separate spaces. Yet we wanted each of those groups to be able to access restroom facilities um, without interfering with the other group. Um, so that is why we have that common space and our restrooms located there. Um, the other thing worth pointing out is we are proposing that that event uh, or that common space would be open during park hours. So anytime the park opens, that space and access to the restrooms would be open while keeping the main event space locked unless it is uh, rented by a group or in, in current use. Um, so it acts similarly to our existing warming house, which is used for you know, changing the ice skates or things like that uh, during the winter. Uh, again, the main event space um, is next. Again, that's uh, 6,000 square feet, um, which is approximately double the size of the current art hall. 
Um, just that alone is double the size of the current art hall. Um, so we are expecting that would hold over 300 people. Um, for a while, we were proposing that to put a, uh, a self-imposed cap of 300 people on there. Um, however, we are finding that now we, we will likely need a sprinkler system because of the uh, kitchen or food prep area. Um, so the, the self-imposed 300 cap is less important now. So we could be able to rate it based on the, uh, the actual occupancy load of that, that building. Um, again, you'll see notice that there are two uh, doors or barn doors on either side on our east and west side, allowing the pass through from our parking lot to our event space. Um, so during a larger event like Dairy Days, people could actually flow right through the building, picking up their food from the kitchen area and actually sitting outside in the, uh, the uh, outdoor picnic area, covered picnic area. Off of the north side is that uh, kitchen, which would have access from either of those event sides or event uh, um, spaces and then there would be uh, roll up service areas um, doors between there so you could do food service into the main hall from that kitchen area um, the proposed kitchen uh, would contain a griddle um, refrigerator freezer um, and then uh, i believe actually the state requirement is that it would contain five different types of sinks um, which sounds crazy but that is what the uh, the state requirement is on a uh, kitchen like this or a food food service area like this um, the remainder of the building is simply storage. Um, so this would contain our AV equipment, our he heating and cooling. Um, the building would be heated both by forced air and in-ground heat and would be uh, air conditioned or have the option of turning on air conditioning if those doors were closed um, so we could keep it cool in the summer for events. Um, with that, I'll have you flip over to your final unit. I apologize, I don't have that one blown up, but that is a site plan that it will be in your packet, and I'll describe it the best I can for those that don't have access to that. Um, site plan essentially shows what our new uh, parking lot uh, is. Um, you'll notice off of there, there are actually three um, proposed pathways that would lead to uh, our event center. The main pathway actually connects up directly across from where our current pathway is, which leads to our ball fields and um, uh, concession stand. Um, so directly across from that now, there would be a pathway that would lead to the front of our event center. Um, also off of the parking lot, there would be a ser service access um, to the back of the building, to our storage area and to our kitchen area, and another pathway that would lead to um, the, that garage door to allow access to that garage door when it is open. Um, there would also be an option of adding a pathway, continuing the pathway, um, to the uh, proposed covered porch area. And then eventually that could lead to a, uh, an additional parking lot. So what's drawn in there dashed in is actually a 35 stall parking lot. Um, we aren't thinking that it will be going in immediately, um, but that would be a po potential addition for future years or if fundraising far exceeds our, our expectations. Um, and I guess with that, I can probably uh, turn it over and answer any questions you might have now. Otherwise, uh, next week or next uh, meeting, uh, Dan Dressens will be in here from Delta 3 and can answer any more technical questions you have. Questions? The more I look at this, the harder it is for me to resist adding things to the wish list. <laughs> um, I have two thoughts I can't resist, but after the last meeting, thinking I still need to want, need and want to say wondering if there's any chance you can put a toilet a water closet off the kitchen so that caterers don't have to come through the event space to use a restroom and then also um, the idea of maybe a private space for uh, the wedding party or whomever is um, the you know guest of honors at a event i'm wondering if maybe even like where you stored the tables could do a purpose for something like that um, but just wondering if there's a private space at all in the, it doesn't look like there is really, right? I, I would say no. Okay. That's my only two thoughts so far. <laughs> the rest is it's all just really exciting to see. So thank you. Any other questions? Look, we'd be, <coughs> excuse me, refiguring the current park lot over by the, what would be the horseshoe pits. Now everybody kind of just pulls in at an angle, parks where they want. Will you be redoing that parking lot at all? Or? So that is, uh, what's proposed there currently is to remove the pavements that would uh, abut the building. 
um, and actually leave the existing drive that would go essentially to the end of the horseshoe pits since that would be reused if and when that uh, additional parking lot were to go in. Um, and we will get, get estimates both for just doing a little corner of that so it, you can kind of see it there there would be a need to fill out a little bit of triangle if we just wanted to have the uh, northern half of those parking stalls um, so we could have that as an option or we could look at adding stalls on both sides of a drive in there which would bring us up to the full 35 instead of you know the 18 stalls on just that north hand side or nothing and just have pull in stalls um, the one thing i will add about parking is simply by striping the main lot which is where we would like the majority of people to park we are expecting a uh, huge increase in efficiency. Um, and then we do have proposed, that one of the reasons we left um, the north side of that parking lot, instead of having pull-in stalls, which would have given us a few extra stalls, we left it and just kind of ended the stalls there so that when we have overflow parking in that grass area, uh, people could follow that same pattern of cars as they're parking there and could continue to park on that grass as overflow until there's a, a definite need to expand that parking lot to the north. you have outdoor um, electrical outlets built into this or does that still have to be on the poles or you know during dairy days so many trailers come in sure i don't know exactly i, I guess i haven't looked I've, I've seen the lighting plan and i studied the lighting plan a bit i didn't look closely enough to to look at what the outdoor or electrical i would assume there would be some but i i don't know to what extent should eliminate the drive-through that people do now correct that has been kind of seen as a, a design flaw in our park generally it's not a good idea to have cars um, going past your outdoor seating areas um, so this would eliminate that drive-through which we view as a positive Any other questions? Thanks, Luke. We'll move on to item I, the Highway Safety Improvement Program Amendment. Karen. Yes, so I'm going to try and fill in for Howard once again. Um, so the city had qualified for a state grant to uh, do some safety improvements on Business Highway 151. Generally, I think everyone was, uh, there was a pretty strong consensus uh, in, in favor of the improvements from Water Street to the east, um, which involved in portions um, taking two lane to three lane and in other portions taking four lane to three lane and then adding a pedestrian um, bike facility on the south side. Um, there were there were concerns though about the proposed improvements from Water Street to the west, um, particularly the impact that uh, changing that lane configuration from two to three lanes would have on the shoulders, which are now currently uh, used a fair amount by bicyclists and pedestrians. Um, city staff had uh, talked with the DOT um, following a public meeting last fall. Um, and they were fairly adamant that the safety grant uh, would not could not apply um, to any any additional work in that area, particularly if it was addressing um, bicyclist needs. Um, um, Dr. Fields from uh, the Community Safe Routes Committee uh, came to a previous council meeting and requested that we retake a look at this, which I think turned out to be a, a really good suggestion. Uh, we had a, another meeting with the, the state DOT and they shifted their position on this and they are willing to propose that this uh, grant uh, be used to uh, do both the three lane configuration but then also to add the shoulder back in um, so that there would be that space for potential bicycle use. Um, if we were to do this, this will increase the cost of the project, although it would still be uh, paid 90% by the state with the 10% city match. The estimate now for the city match would be about 180000 
Uh, it's also, uh, the work would be delayed a year. So rather than beginning next year in uh, 2020, it would, uh, the construction would, design would take place in 2020 and construction would actually take place in 2021. So uh, basically we're looking for, if this is the, indeed the, the direction the council would like to go, if the council does uh, approve this as the direction we want to go. It still needs to go through an approval process at the state with their committee. Um, but assuming that that committee approves it, um, then the, the plan would shift and, and the changes that I previously described would take place. Okay, questions. Karen, we've already budgeted the 115 294, right? That's the current 10% of the original budgeted cost. We budgeted a much smaller portion of that for design work this year, I believe, but the majority of the match was gonna come next year. It was gonna come next year. Okay, and so the new cost is about 60,000 more. Correct. Yeah. But again, 90% of that is being paid for by the state of the total project. Any other questions? I guess I maybe should also add that uh, Howard intends to reach out to the business owners uh, with respect to this potential change as well. Uh, we wouldn't be requiring any land from them. Uh, this change could still take place within the easements that exist, uh, but it, it may cause slightly more disruption. Okay. Any questions? Well, then I believe we're completed with the uh, uh, public portion here of, well, not the, the information and discussion items. And we're going to move into a work session. Uh, we haven't been on camera tonight anyway, although we will be on the YouTube channel. Um, currently, we don't have a TV feed. So uh, we'll uh, adjourn to the table uh, for our work, to work session with our economic development partners, uh, Paydeck, Main Street, and the Platinum Business Incubator. And uh, let's do that, take a quick break, and 